Hey, hey, friends. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this online gathering of Redeeming Hope. We're so glad that you're joining us as we are in the fourth week of Advent. Christmas is this week, and we're so excited to be sharing this time with you. I want to remind us of why we get together and why we do what we do. It's so important for us to remember our vision and our values and just what makes us a family come together. And so at Redeeming Hope, we exist as a family of faith that follows Jesus and then helps others find him by living all of life as missionaries of hope. This means that we want to follow the life and teachings of Jesus, but we want to be really open to anyone, regardless of where you might be on your spiritual journey. And so to help us with that, we have four values that shape everything we do as a church. And so um, if you're joining us, even if you do not identify as a follower of Jesus, you're welcome here. Even if you don't believe the Bible is true, you're welcome here. If you are hurting, you're welcome here. And if you have questions, you absolutely are welcome here. And in this time of being physically distant, we want to still be relationally and spiritually connected. And so I want to encourage you, if you have questions, if you want to engage with what we're talking about today, or you just have needs, I want you to know that we're here for you as a church. And so you can text us at 931 326 4512, or you can email me personally, josh at redeeminghope.org, and we can get some time together to talk about the sermon, or if you have a need that we can partner with you and help you meet. Um, we just want to know that, we want you to know that we're here for you. Also, I'm really excited, guys. We've been working extremely hard over the past month or two to multiply groups in the new year. And so we're actually, I believe we're going to be getting four, maybe five groups that are going to multiply out of existing groups because we've got more people jumping in with our church now than ever before. And so I just want to thank you guys so much for your consistent faithfulness. For those of you who are newer in our context, we've got groups that are getting prepared for you so we can all be reading the Bible, we can be following Jesus and exploring his life and teachings together as a family. And so if you want more information about that, again, that you can text us about those two. If you're in another state, if you're um, on the other side of the world, you're more welcome to join us. We actually, most of them will have Zoom capability. And again, you can text us 931-326-4512. You can email me, josh at Redeeming Hope. Also, if you would like to partner with the good work that God is doing here in Clarksville um, by partnering with us financially, you can go to our website, redeeminghope.org slash give, or you can find us on Venmo at Redeeming Hope and your gifts are tax deductible. Now, um, we, like I mentioned before, we're in the fourth week of Advent. Advent literally just means arrival and Christians for hundreds of years have taken the first four weeks leading up to Christmas to prepare our hearts for the coming of Christ, to celebrate his coming. And it's kind of a reenactment of the thousands of years that we were promised a savior, but then had to wait for him to come. And so we kind of reenact this through Advent. And we do a few things a little differently at Redeeming Hope. One thing that we're doing, um, and by the way, you can find all of these resources at redeeminghope.org slash Advent. So we've got a whole um, song list for you. We're doing a daily devotional called The Dawning of Indestructible Joy, and that's available on our website as well. And then once a week, we're encouraging uh, heads of household to gather their families together to read a few passages of scripture and to light an additional candle. But we also do the candle lighting here at our gatherings. And so we're calling this Advent at Home. And right now we're gonna tune in to Jason, Katie, Thomas, and Ben, and uh, as they light our candle on the fourth week, the candle of peace. We are the Sanders family, and we are lighting the candle of peace. Okay. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of this increase, of the increase of his government and of the peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall dwell secure. 
For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and, shall, and he shall be their peace. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in, in swelling cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there will with was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and said glory of glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom who he pleased. And on this fourth Sunday we light of Advent we light this candle of peace. We love you, Redeeming Hope. Thank you, Redeeming Thank you. Hope. Yeah. Friends, as we continue in our sermon series called The Rescuer, um, I just kind of want to remind us where we've been and where we're going today. And I want to remind us, too, that we are focusing on Jesus as the rescuer. Our focus is squarely on his work on our behalf to rescue us from sin and from brokenness and from suffering. And so a couple weeks ago, we talked about the promise of a rescuer, where we looked at the promise of that Eve, that the woman would have an offspring, not the man, but the woman would. And we traced that through the beginning of the Old Testament. Last week, we looked at the hope of a rescuer, and we looked at Ezekiel's prophecy about a shepherd who would come, a good shepherd who would come, and shepherd his people. And today we're seeing the rescuer arriving. That's the title of our sermon for today. And so after millennia of waiting, we see that the promised offspring of Eve is miraculously birthed into the world. And so for order, in order for us to see the rescuer, we have to see what we're being rescued from. Now, you see, within the world around us and actually the world within us, there is pain, there's evil, there's suffering and fear. What we find is that we're born into this brokenness, that we're surrounded by it, and that we constantly are fighting and pushing and pulling against this brokenness for our entire lives. And we've all experienced someone hurting us in a way that leaves a lasting impression. And if we're honest with ourselves, we have all inflicted hurt and pain onto others. And so we've been exploring in this series how different people respond to the brokenness. And, and we've kind of honed in on, on three different ways that people are responding to this. One, some of us seek to rise above the brokenness by our own strength. If I just work harder, do more, be better, then I won't have to engage with the brokenness. Um, others um, are just, just feel the incredible weight of the brokenness in this world, and they just are in this really felt despair in their life. And some of us seek to distract from this brokenness by trinkets or toys, relationships, or even vocations. And so it's this last point that I really want to draw our attention to today as we look at the rescuer arriving. And I, I think that people in Clarksville, uh, some of us look within ourselves, right, to try to fight against this brokenness. But I, I think that some people around us look to things outside of ourselves to try to resolve this brokenness, to rescue us from hurts or pains and difficulties. And, and I think some people tend to turn to relationships to get affirmation, right? You, you pour your life out into someone, and really the question is, do you love me? Am I truly worthy of your love? I'll give you all of me to strive for your love. And that's how some of us tend to resolve this brokenness. Um, others can actually, especially we found this in, in the, the Southern church context as well, some people turn to ministry within the church as a means of self-validation, as a means of security. So, so the thought process is, if I succeed in church, maybe God will be proud of me. Can I sacrifice enough to truly earn his approval? And I think some of us look outside of ourselves and we turn to vocations for our personal validity, right? Am I good enough to succeed in this job or this educational pursuit? And when I get the degree or the promotion or the raise, then maybe I'll be finally worthy of respect when I'm successful. And I think all of these, all of these things are our are, are attempts to look outside of ourselves to solve the brokenness within. And, and so as a church today, we want to address these attempts at validation through these external pursuits by looking at the inability of anything 
or anyone apart from Jesus the rescuer to rescue us from the deep pain that we feel when we're separated from God. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Our main point for today is this, that the rescuer arriving means that we can be released from the strive for love through unhealthy relationships. We can be released from earning approval through overworking and ministry. We can also be released from fighting for respect through vocational success. And then, and then when we are released from that, the, the second part of our, our point is that we can then rest in the sin-killing, soul-saving, salvation-bringing arrival of Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. So we're going to go a kind of three movements today. The first one is the, the rescuer is miraculous. Next, we're going to see how the rescuer comes in the midst of tension. And finally, we're going to see how the rescuer saves us from sin. So let's begin. We're going to be in Matthew chapter one today, looking at how the angel is speaking to Joseph. And so this is where we come to Matthew one, starting in verse 18, as we look at how the rescuer is miraculous. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, that means engaged, before they came together, before they consummated a marriage, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Now, um, we saw two weeks ago that a special offspring from the woman, from Eve, would come and that, that offspring would crush the head of the serpent of evil in the world. And so the miracle of this virgin birth is the fulfillment of a prophecy dating all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And it teaches us so many things. But I want to dial into just one thing it really shows us. My friends, the miraculous birth shows us that we cannot save ourselves. We can't do it ourselves. Unless you got some secret that I don't know about having babies, like biology is restrictive here, okay? So it's, it's saying that there's something miraculous that has to come in in order to accomplish a virgin birth. And so what we see, the miraculous arrival of Jesus the rescuer, it shows us that we cannot give birth to our own Savior, no matter how much we may try. And so as we look at it through the lens of relationships or um, ministry or vocation, uh, you know, we first see that relationships will disappoint you um, because other people can't be your savior. They can't bear the weight of your need for selfless love. No one can ever truly give that like God can. And so if you look to your children as your identity, they'll either resent you or they'll cling to you when you place your identity onto your children. Um, when, you, when you have a partner, whether you have a spouse or a boyfriend or girlfriend, um, partners will take advantage of you eventually, right? Because they'll, they'll take more than what they give because they'll never be able to give all of themselves, right? We, we're limited by sin and, and brokenness in order for us to give truly everything. Only God can truly give all of himself to us. And what we also see is that even if we turn to our friend group or in relationships, that friends will eventually be repulsed by your need for them to be consistently available when you're hurting, angry, lonely, or tired. Our friends cannot be omnipresent for us in our needs, right? So when we look to relationships, they say relationships will ultimately disappoint us if we look to them as our Savior. Next, we see that ministry will crush us if we look to that as our Savior because we'll be working out of our own power to do the work that God intended us to do with Him, right? We'll try to work independently of God if we try to get get ministry to be our savior, to solve this brokenness. What, what'll happen is you'll overserve with reckless abandon. You'll harm yourself, you'll harm your family. And in that process, you'll hope that ministry will earn you a spot as God's favorite child. But here's the reality. The cold reality is that we'll, we're never going to feel like we've done enough. And so you'll eventually, this is what I've seen happen too. And, and sometimes even in my own life, as I've overserved and overreached and overgiven, is that I eventually got bitter with the church or ministry because it didn't give me what I wanted. I wasn't serving of the right heart to be a servant of God. I was looking to get something from the ministry I was in. And, and what happens is, is that when the ultimate end of this is we're fighting like an orphan for the seat at God's table of approval. That's what our, we're thinking. We're thinking we're an orphan. We're not recognizing that we're a child and we're looking to ministry to earn our way to God's seat of approval. Finally, if you turn to your vocation, vocation such as a job or an educational pursuit to try to save you, it will eventually fail you because you will never have enough success through credentials, through money, or through position to feel like that you are worthy 
of respect. What'll happen is, is that'll make you bitter against people that have more than you, more success. It'll make you resent and disdain the people that have less than you. And it'll just drive you into pride and despair and bitterness in equal measure because nothing that you earn or do outside of you can ever change what's inside of you, right? So we all look to try to do things outside of us to change the inside of us, but we'll continue to fight and try to get ahead and meanwhile just push others away. And what all of this shows us is that we cannot give birth to a miraculous Savior. We can't, through our actions, accomplish our own salvation. What we see in the miraculous birth of Jesus is that only God can accomplish this, that God's faithfulness to send a miraculous rescuer through a miraculous birth, it actually shows us there's only one way to be saved. And it's not through relationships. It's not through ministry. It's not through vocations, but it is only through Jesus. And his arrival is miraculous in the world to show us that our salvation is only through him. Now, next we see that the rescuer, he comes in the midst of, of tension. Let's continue the story as the angel is speaking to Joseph. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, he resolved to divorce Mary quietly. But as he was considering these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived from her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're on the outside looking in at Joseph and Mary's relationship as Mary becomes pregnant, yet also being a virgin, what you'll see is, is that from the outside looking in, it looks like that, that Joseph knocked Mary up. That's what it'll look like. But from Joseph's vantage point, it looks like, man, Mary cheated on me. And there's so few places in the Bible where we, we get a picture of who Joseph is. He's not really that prevalent or prominent in the scriptures. Um, and he was Jesus's adopted dad. And you'd think that he might have a little bit more significance, but the Bible just doesn't give us a lot of information about him. But this passage gives us a crucial clue about Joseph's character and who he was as a man. See, he was, it says he was going to divorce her quietly. Now remember in that culture, if you were engaged with someone, a, a woman, and she cheated on you, you, and you had proof of it, you could have her killed. Like you could like totally wipe it out and you could have her and the baby killed. That's what that culture was like. And so Joseph, out of deep sadness, believing that she cheated on him, still was not going to shame her. He wasn't going to destroy her to seek retribution or to ruin her life. And my friends, this is huge. This gives us a, a, just a little tiny picture into Joseph. Joseph's character. But can you imagine what Mary was thinking at this moment? She's like, this angel comes to me. I agree to bear the promised Messiah. I say, I am just a slave of God. That's literally what she says. She calls herself a servant, but really that word means slave of God. And, and she's willing to do whatever God asks her to do. And she thinks that she's losing her godly husband as a result of it. Can you imagine the turmoil in this young little family? Can you imagine what they're wrestling with right now? And it's in the midst of that tension that God appears through an angel, speaking through an angel. He steps in and, and through his messenger, through his angel, he calls Joseph to an incredible step of obedience. God says, no, don't fear. God literally says, I caused this to happen. It's on me. Stay faithful to her. Trust me. You see, we see this miraculous angel appears to Mary in the book of Luke and it, it, it appears to Joseph here in Matthew. And in the midst of the difficulty of Joseph's life, God is drawing him into a deeper reliance on his word and on his promises. Do you see that? Do you see how, how this is so interesting, how in the midst of this turmoil of Joseph's life upheaval, and he's trying to respond like a godly man, but then God steps in and says, do you trust me? Do you trust my word? And do you trust my promises. My friends, what we see from this is that God often uses tension. He often uses stress, job transition, family conflict. He uses these things to draw us to see who the true rescuer in our life really is. So when your relationships don't give you the selfless love that you long for, God is drawing you to see his unrelenting, his faithful, his constant love for you. 
when your ministry is failing, if it's not going the way that you want it to, what God is drawing you to see is that he is already proud of you for being his son or his daughter, apart from earning his approval. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to tick evangelism off on your list. You don't have to start more groups to have God see you as his beloved son and daughter who he's proud of, who's pleased with. Maybe that's what God's drawing you into. And finally, when you lose your job or you fail that class, you don't get that promotion, that raise, God is drawing you to see yourself how he sees you, made in his image, worthy of his delight, regardless of your ability to succeed or not. See, like Joseph, my friends, God is calling us to see the true spiritual nature behind our conflicts and struggles, to be drawn into the deeper seed of faith, that he is placing in us through our circumstances, through our tension points in our life. The rescuer of our souls often is revealed in the midst of tension. And not only that, but he wants us to act in faith. He invites us to act in faith in his word and faith in his promises, believing that he is a rescuer for us that saves us and meets our ultimate need. Now we move on to Matthew 1, 21. It says, she will bear him. This is still the angel, God speaking through an angel to Joseph in a dream. He says, she will bear him a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Now, before we get to that second part that we want to spend the bulk of our time on, um, just a little side note at the beginning here. Naming Jesus is crucial. It's very culturally significant. What it ensures here is that Joseph is Jesus's legal father and that Jesus bears the official status as Joseph's adopted son and heir when he chooses to name Jesus. And so that's very significant that he says, you will call his name Jesus. Now, but, but, but that's, that's the side note. But look at what Jesus the rescuer saves us from. It says he saves us from our sins. My friends, we were created good, true, and beautiful in the garden. We were created without sin. And unfortunately, because of Adam and Eve, they were tempted. They were drawn away from God. And they introduced sin and brokenness in the world. And sin, it, it's like a weed. It has infested this beautiful garden called earth that God had created, this beautiful heart that was supposed to be aligned with him. This sin and this brokenness is like a weed that has been spreading for thousands of years. God even said to the serpent, the snake, he said, You're, uh, you will have offspring. And what he's talking about here, we talked about this a few weeks ago, is the offspring of the serpent is evil in the world. And so we see evil has propagated, it has expanded. There is brokenness in us and there is broken around us. There's evil, pain, suffering, and fear. We're born into it. It's outside of us. You can't turn on the news without seeing it. It's in us. You can't look in the mirror without feeling it. And what we find is that we all seek to try to resolve it in some way, shape, or form. There's always this deep level of brokenness that we're trying to fight against in some way. And my friends, our ultimate need is not to have to strive to be loved. It's to see that God has already infinitely loved us. Our ultimate need isn't to earn God's approval by serving him. It's to see that God approves of his son Jesus in our place. And he approves of us when we rest in Jesus's finished work on our behalf. Our ultimate need isn't to fight for respect through success. It is to see that we are already made in God's image that there's no need to fight anymore, that he already delights in us, in our failures, and in our successes. My friends, Jesus comes to save us, what? He comes to save us from our sins, from our sins, and all of the weeds that have grown up as a result of those sins, the thing that perpetuates this brokenness in us and around us. What we see later is that Jesus, when he grows up to be a man, he will take the punishment for our sins that you and I deserve. And then we see in the following verses, after this beautiful picture of he will come and save his people from their sins, we see in the verses that this is not random. Like this isn't happenstance. God just wasn't bored and one day decided, oh, I guess I'm going to now send Jesus. But it's all been a part of this beautiful, carefully orchestrated plan by our father since the garden, millennia, Thousands and thousands of years of human history, God has been preparing and crafting and molding and shaping this plan to rescue 
you and me. Look with me at Matthew 1, 22 to 23. It's, and this is, again, explaining this to us. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, my friends, he's referencing a quote from Isaiah 7, 14. Isaiah was written seven to a 700 to 1,000 years before Jesus walked the earth. God has had a plan to come save us, and he has been progressively revealing this plan throughout the entirety of Old Testament, throughout the entirety of millennia of human history. It's getting more and more building up to the culmination point of Jesus' arrival, his birth, his death, his resurrection, and ultimately his defeat of sin. My friends, God does not save us in a cold and distant way. What he does is he comes in. God enters in to his creation. He comes into the battleground of our hearts. He gets in with us in the foxhole. He enters into our suffering, into our pain. He experiences it with us and he experiences it for us. He incarnates. He adds to his divinity, humanity, so that we may be truly intimately and completely saved by a God that knows everything that we have ever experienced. My friends, this rescuer, he is Jesus, our salvation. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he's with us in our broken relationships when we strive for love. He's with us in our broken ministry when we seek to earn God's approval. He is with us in our broken vocations when we fight to earn God's delight that he has already freely given us through his son. And my friends, he has come to rescue us from every lesser savior that cannot give life, that cannot ultimately satisfy the deep need that our hearts have for love, for approval, for delight, and for security. And what he does is he doesn't just save us from this brokenness, but he actually saves us into the very things that we want. He saves us into love. The Bible says that God is love, that he lavishes his love on his children. He saves us into approval. If you choose to follow Jesus, everything that is true, every promise that is true of Jesus is true of you. God sees you as he sees his son. He is delighted in us. He he, he saves us into delight. He loves spending time with you. He loves intimacy with you. He loves getting to know you. You, personally, not just the collective you of redeeming hope or whoever is watching this message, but you as you sit here watching this right now, he loves you. He delights in you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants more time with you. And as he does that, you begin to change. And and as you spend time with Christ, he then leads us into, loves us into, saves us into security that we can now rest. The work is over. There's nothing we have to do to earn or fight for God's love. It is freely given to us because of Jesus. All we have to do is repent and believe this message, and he will save us into all of these wonderful things that he lavishes us with, regardless of our level of obedience. Now, my friends, this leads us again to our main point is this, that the rescuer arriving means that we can be released from the strive for love through unhealthy relationships from earning approval through overworking in ministry or fighting for respect through vocational success. We can rest in the sin-killing, soul-saving, salvation-bringing arrival of Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. And if, if you're joining us and you look back over the course of your life and you just can't find that stake in the ground moment where you said, yes, I choose to believe in Jesus. I choose to give him my life. I choose to make him Lord and King over my life. If you look over the course of your life, you can't see that. I want to invite you today, right now, where you're sitting, I want to invite you to truly give your life to Jesus. The Bible says we need to have repentance and faith. We need to turn away from all the other ways we try to save ourselves. We turn to relationships. We turn to ministry. We turn to our vocations to save ourselves. Turn towards Jesus and his work for us. And then we hear this message. This is what faith is, HBO. Hear it, believe it, and obey it by making Jesus Lord over your life. That's what you can do. Now, if, if that is you, if you look back in your history, say, yes, I've done that, Josh. 
my friends, it is still so easy for us to sink into looking to relationships or ministry or vocations to try to give us identity and worth and value, right? Like I struggle with that. And you guys who are part of our church know that it's something I still struggle with to this day of trying to see ministry as the way I, I, I appear successful and I can be loved, right? And, and, and what God leads me into consistently, convicts me of, is that I don't need to earn his approval. It's already been given to me. And so Christian, if you're here, I want to invite you to re-believe this again, not for your salvation, but for your sanctification so that you can become more like Jesus so that you can receive this message that, that the, the work is over, the pressure's off. You don't have to fight. You don't have to earn. You don't have to work. Your father loves you. He delights in you. You're not an orphan trying to scrap for his attention. You are a son or daughter that gets a seat at his table. His table is lavish with love, with approval, with delight, with identity that he wants to pump into you consistently so that you can then be his light to the world around you. My friends, sin, suffering, brokenness, the curse of the fall, it's like a weed and it's spread for millennia. It's overtaking. Sometimes it's overwhelming, it seems like, right? With just the amount of brokenness that's around us. But my friends, Jesus, the good news is, the gospel is that Jesus has come to defeat sin. He has arrived specially for you to pull up all the, we the weeds of brokenness and sin in your life that plagues you and me. And he's come to let his blessings flow. And this is what leads us as we end to the words of Isaac Watts in Joy to the World. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found.